All right, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. My name is Ben Ramirez. I'm the Vice President for the World Affairs Council of Austin. And we're really grateful for the partnership that we have with the Austin School Lecture Series. Uh, Dr. Roy Casagrande was not able to join us this evening. He uh, sends his regrets, but I'm uh, more than happy to be here and, and uh, see you all this evening. So uh, please keep an eye out on the Austin School Lecture Series website for more lectures that are planned for this coming semester. And of course, uh, we're hoping that this uh, video will uh, be available for those individuals who weren't able to make it here this evening. As I mentioned, my name is Ben Ramirez, and uh, the World Affairs Council of Austin uh, is a nonprofit organization. It's a local chapter for a nationwide organization. Our website here for the local is www wacaustin.org, and uh, also on Twitter, at WAC Austin. We put on a number of programs, uh, at least two events each month, and so uh, we're really very fortunate uh, to have with us uh, a fantastic speaker to talk about truth stranger than fiction this afternoon. We'll get a little bit of a unique perspective on how U.S. foreign policy is developed. And we're really fortunate to have our guest speaker here this evening, who traveled uh, from Washington to be with us. He is a senior fellow with the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C. He was a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. He has a focus on U.S.-Africa relations, energy policy, and private investment. Previously, he was a professor at the London School of Economics and at Georgetown University. He has several nonfiction and fiction books. Uh, his uh, latest nonfiction books include African Development and Oil for Cash. Oil to Cash, actually. Oil to Cash. And he also does a fictitious series for Putnam Books about a State Department crisis manager. And those titles include The Golden Hour, Minute Zero, Ghost of Havana, and recently released the shadow list. So please join me in offering a warm Texas welcome to Mr. Todd Moss. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Um, thank you all for coming out on this uh, lousy day. Um, I, I've been talking to a lot of World Affairs Councils uh, over the last couple of years. And it's always interesting that some of them really want to go into the weeds about U.S. foreign policy issues. They want to talk about very specific issues. Um, but everybody always wants to talk about the novels. Uh, so this year, when I'm, I'm um, talking to World Affairs Councils, I'm trying to do both. I talk a little bit about U.S. foreign policy, a little bit about the thrillers that I write, and how real events, what I've seen on the inside of U.S. government, how that's helped me write thrillers, and what I'm trying to tell audiences with thrillers about U.S. foreign policy. Um, so hopefully I'll, you'll get a little bit um, of all of that. Um, and so what I want to tell you about are sort of three big trends um, that I've seen in my personal life and in my professional life that led me to write the latest book, The Shadow List, which just came out a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and really, I mean, I'm not going to talk for very long, we can, and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, my path to being uh, an economist who works on Africa and then a diplomat and then a novelist is all very random, uh, not planned out, um, and uh, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about how that, how that happened um, as well if people are interested in that. Um, I'm going to guess if you're anything like the other groups I've spoken to, some of you here um, are writing novels or, in the back of your mind, hope to write novels one day. So I'm uh, really happy to talk to you about that. I encourage that. So um, I became a novelist actually by accident. 
Uh, so I left the state, I, I, through a series of other accidents, I had the great fortune to work for Condoleezza Rice as her West Africa uh, lead. Um, and lots of crazy things happened um, in government, um, good and bad. Um, but when I left government um, and I went back to the Center for Global Development, which is a think tank, which is a private research institution that works on global economic issues that affect poverty, um, my experience in government really affected how I think about trying to influence our own government. That's the job of a think tank. You do research to try to influence the government. Um, and so I actually started writing an outline for a nonfiction book about how screwed up US foreign policy is, the way we make it, the way our government makes decisions, the way we implement foreign policy, um, all about the infighting, the backbiting, you're going to read in, uh, you know, at university how foreign policy is made. You know, you assess the situation, you make a decision that's best for the country, and then you deploy whatever tools you have to solve that problem. It really doesn't work like that. Um, and so I started writing a nonfiction book, and I just decided, you know what, that's not going to be really in that interesting. I'd written four nonfiction books, and they're fun, but they take a lot out of you. And so I thought, you know. I could, really, I could really have more fun for me if I wrote this as a novel. So completely on a lark, partly to just get a lot off my chest, I wrote this novel um, based on a true experience that I had in West Africa when there was a coup in, uh, in a country called Mauritania on the coast of West Africa, and I was sent to try to reverse this coup. Um, and if that sounds kind of ridiculous, it was. Um, and then through a series of other things that happened, uh, again, a series of accidents, um, I got lucky enough to publish this through one of the houses of Penguin. Um, and then they asked for four, they said, well, we'll do it, but you have to give us three more. Um, so I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the process for how I come up with the topics for thrillers and what they say about US foreign policy. I thought I'd talk right now about the latest one, The Shadow List, and how that happened. And then I'll come back a little bit to the other ones and some of the lessons uh, for foreign policy. So one thing that really struck me is um, in my life, it seemed like I grew up in a very kind of quiet suburban um, neighborhood outside Rochester, New York, not far from the Canadian border. Not very much was happening there. Um, but it seemed that crime and corruption was kind of popping up everywhere. So I kept getting these emails from a prince in Nigeria or the widow of a, of a dictator promising me great witch, riches if I send them my bank account. Obviously, that was a scam, but it just kept happening. Um, we started having ID theft all the time. My wife's ID was stolen, and people were taking out credit cards in her name. We just saw the Equifax hack that's going to lead to many of us uh, having our IDs stolen. Um, all kinds of cyber theft going on. Um, I started reading more about tra uh, trafficking of all kinds of things. So we learn about, in economics class, we learn about the global economy, global trade, and how that works. But in reality, there are, there's trillions of dollars in illegal things traded every day, whether it's drugs or illegal cigarettes or people um, or guns. That's going on uh, in lots of places. Um, there was an incident a few years ago. I'm in Washington, I live in Washington, D.C. now. I'm a big baseball fan. I follow the Washington Nationals. And in the offseason, our catcher, Wilson Ramos, went home to Venezuela, and he was kidnapped for ransom. Um, and that was a kind of shock to the community. Well, oh, you know, not long after that, a good friend of mine who, uh, who lives in Nigeria, her mother was kidnapped uh, for ransom. Um, and so this all started, <laughs> you're looking very shocked, but this, I started, this all started adding up to me. That I was seeing a lot more crime sort of everywhere. And in particular, I was seeing a lot of corruption. Now, I work on Africa, so you would expect to see some corruption. A lot of corruption of politics. And it was not just in Nigeria or Zimbabwe or uh, Kenya, where I do a lot of work. But I was seeing, I've lived in the UK. I was seeing corruption there. I live in Washington, DC. And corruption is in your face every single day. And this all just sort of started to seem like this was building towards something quite, quite important. 
Um, and then I was, it all kind of came together when I picked up a book by a guy named Moises Naim, uh, and it's called Illicit, and it's about, um, it's about the illicit networks around the world that are far more pervasive than we know. And reading this, it was like, oh my god, yes, it was all coming together. So I, in thinking about my fourth novel, I really had this idea of crime and corruption kind of in the, in the atmosphere. So that was one, the, one aspect. The other aspect is that I was seeing from my, when I was at the State Department that crime and corruption was actually intersecting with US national security in some very, very concrete ways. Um, so I worked a lot on um, a country in West Africa, Mali, which is right in the middle of West Africa. And it's, um, it's twice the size of Texas. And uh, it has very few people. And the whole northern part of it is mostly desert. There are some, a few people that live there. Um, there happens to be smuggling um, routes through there that have been going on for millennia. People have been trading salt, gold, all of that. You've heard of Timbuktu. Timbuktu was a trading center in the north of Mali. And to this day, there are smuggling routes all through the Sahara Desert that go from the West African coast up to Morocco, Algeria, Libya, and then into Europe. And, that's, and for thousands of years, people in that part of the world made their living essentially by smuggling or trafficking in illegal things across, across the desert. Now, that was going on um, at the same time that um, uh, radical Islamic groups from Algeria were spreading into that part of the world. Um, and we were really seeing an intersection of these smuggling routes with uh, extreme, violent extremist groups that were trying to be, they were part of the, at the time, part of the Al-Qaeda global network. And we were really seeing an overlay of that. Um, uh, you've obviously seen the interplay of uh, the Taliban and the global uh, opium trade is, is another good example. Um, we're now seeing um, international criminal cartels. Uh, Colombian drug lords uh, are not just trading through West Africa, but there's a little country on the West African coast called Guinea-Bissau, which is now a narco state. It's essentially run by narco traffickers. Um, so you're now seeing, you're seeing countries actually being taken over by international criminal uh, cartels. And you're seeing those cartels become more and more powerful and getting involved in more and more uh, in the trade of more and more um, goods. Um, and at the same time, the US is in many ways trying to stop all of that. Uh, but the US has neither the capability nor really the desire to kind of be the world's policeman. So how do we deal with traffickers in West Africa who are interacting and maybe trading with terrorists that are attacking our embassies and our allies, how do we do that? Uh, we actually work with allies. That's how we do it. So we were trying to build the Malian military. We were working with the Nigerian government, working with the Ghanaians, the Senegalese, to try to build up their capabilities to police that area and help us jointly solve problems like crime, corruption, and cartels. Now, of course, the, the, the irony here, well, let me come back to that in a second. So one, one of, the, one of the, the outcomes of this is that the US, as the largest economy and the largest uh, military power in the world, you know, arrives in a poor country that has a, some kind of security problem. We say, yes, we want to help you. Um, and we've got all this stuff and uh, we're very easily played, right? So in the Cold War, you'll remember, we wanted to contain the Russians everywhere. So we were very, very vulnerable to countries saying, we have communists, or we're going to help you fight the communists. And we were all in. We were all in economically, militarily, and we would get easily get played. Well, I was starting to see that in West Africa, where we were being played on counterterrorism. We were being played on narco-trafficking. And it was really one of those dilemmas that, um, that our officials, that our officials uh, struggle with every day, which is who are our real allies and how do we, how do we know? Um, the other thing about the pervasiveness, the national security implications of the pervasiveness of these international criminal and corruption networks 
is that now the United States is getting pulled into all kinds of places that maybe we didn't historically care about. So Guinea-Bissau, not really an important place for US national security. However, is it, in the US, is it in our interest to have a country in West Africa controlled by Colombian drug cartels? Absolutely not. Is it in our interest, as happened in Mali, that the northern half of the country was taken over by Islamic radicals that tried to create a caliphate so that they could attack all of our allies and eventually us? Um, absolutely not. So the US is getting dragged in to these regions where historically we actually weren't very involved, again reinforcing that need to work with, with local allies that are, that are reliable partners. So we've got the criminal cartels and criminal networks growing around the world. We've got the US getting sucked in to this for good or ill um, on a national security basis. And then uh, the third big thing, um, and if you read my books, you'll, you'll, you'll see it, I hope it shines through, is that we're not very good at this and our tools for dealing with these problems are actually incredibly weak. Um, in particular, our government is not set up to deal with these complex range of problems. Now, a big part of it and a big theme of all of my novels is that the government, our government is so big and so fragmented that officials mostly spend time fighting with each other. Um, the, the, uh, that was certainly my experience in the State Department. Um, so I worked in State Department. I worked in a small corner of the State Department which is the Africa Bureau, right? So there are bureaus for each region of the world. There are bureaus for counterterrorism, bureaus for economics, bureaus for science, bureaus for democracy and human rights. Anyone, anyone want to guess how many employees of the Africa Bureau of the State Department? Now keep in mind we, had, we have 45 embassies that also need to be staffed. But how many, anyone want to guess? A little corner of the State Department? Somebody guess, guess. Okay, 20. Okay, no, 1,500. Okay, 1,500. That's just the Africa Bureau. Okay, now you have to imagine that the, the State Department is about 25,000 people. They're trying to do a lot, so they have a lot of people, a lot of bureaus. Um, I could go to a meeting. We're going to decide on what should we do about narco traffickers in Guinea-Bissau. Um, and it's not just the Africa Bureau there. We might have a team of 10 or 12 that work on this issue. There would be somebody from the Counter Narcotics Bureau, and there would be somebody from the Environment Bureau, and there would be someone, and you could easily, easily have 25 people in the room of whom, if I'm lucky, I, I would know half of them, and we all have different goals, different objectives, and we're supposed to come up with a common, a common policy. That's just for the State Department. Now we go over to the White House for an interagency coordination meeting on what's the US policy going to be. So now you've got the State Department, maybe figured it out. Now you've got the Defense Department, the Treasury Department, who it can often, at minimum, you'd have a dozen agencies there, plus White House staff, plus the different intelligence agencies. And you can easily see that this becomes it becomes very unmanageable, and that you don't often get a good decision because everyone is playing games. Now, if there were, if it's okay, if let's say there's four of us, the four of us are the gov four government agencies. We know each other. We've dealt with each other on dozens of issues. We're going to horse trade and figure out the best thing in this case, and maybe I'll concede to you on this issue, but you'll concede to me on the next issue. That's fine. That's how Norway does it, right? They get six people in a room and they figure out what they're gonna do. The United States government is not Norway, okay? So it's 25 people for state, maybe they send th three to five to the interagency meeting, then you've got 25 people. I've literally been in a room with more than 40 people deciding an issue that if I told you what it was about, you wouldn't believe because it was so um, so unimportant. This was on the trade status for the Comoros Islands in the, East, uh, in the Indian Ocean. More than 45 people. Now, um, those are extreme cases, but it gives you a little bit of a sense of how 
fragmented and how the government is often very, very dysfunctional um, in, in getting things done. Now this becomes even more difficult when we're trying to work with foreign partners. Um, the CIA may be telling our foreign partners one thing, the Defense Department may be telling them something else, state could be telling them four different things at the same time, the ambassador could say one thing, headquarters could say something else. Um, and all of this means that, um, that we're not very good at dealing with these complicated issues, um, even when you have very, very high uh, attention. I'll give you uh, the example I always think about is um, the U.S. response to the earthquake in Haiti. Now, the U.S., one thing we are very good at is lift capacity and humanitarian response. That is just something our government is actually really, really good at. It happens all the time. We had, you remember Haiti had this horrible earthquake. We had the Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton, in Haiti. She was with the head of the USAID and the head of the UN uh, effort at ha Haitian Relief was her husband, Bill Clinton. So you could not have had more high-level attention to an issue, and we could, not, we could not command all of our forces to actually have a, a, a sensible response in Haiti. Um, and to this day, there are still people in Haiti living in tents. Um, um, so working with our partners on crime and corruption, it, it, it gets, all of this gets exceedingly complicated. And it's even worse, if I haven't depressed you enough, which is that the partners that we're dealing with to deal with crime and corruption are, are themselves often undermined by crime and corruption. And I'm going to come back to that um, uh, in, in a minute. So I wanted to sort of tell all this story, and not, although it looks like I've depressed some of you, especially you. <laughs> um, um, I actually wanted to try to do it in a fun way. So the, the first novel was about a coup in Mali. I actually wrote it um, before there was a real coup in Mali. Uh, you may remember, you probably don't, but after Gaddafi fell, all the, there were all these mercenaries in Libya. They all came into Mali, and they took over uh, half of the country um, in, the, in the wake of chaos after there was a, a real coup. Now, it looks like I predicted all this with my novel. I actually didn't. I actually thought Mali was doing pretty well. I just thought that Timbuktu was a really romantic place to set a novel and that people would know Timbuktu and want to want to read about that place. Um, but it was based on a real coup that took place in Mauritania where we were getting played by our partner who was telling us that they were fighting terrorists when they were actually using our aircraft to do all kinds of things they shouldn't have been doing, um, including overthrowing their own democratically elected leader. Um, the second book is called Minute Zero. I got my start in Africa. I became an Africa junkie as an exchange student in Zimbabwe uh, many years ago. And I've been hooked on Zimbabwe ever since. But while I was in government, there was an election in Zimbabwe. This was in 2008. And the president lost. The opposition won. And we waited for the big results. And they didn't announce it. They didn't announce it. They waited a month to announce it. And then they announced there'd be a runoff. And what they did was they literally took the voting data, which villages voted for us and which voted for the opposition. And they then attacked those villages that voted against them. And so in the runoff, the opposition was essentially chased out of town. Now, that was, that was a, a literally one of the most horrific things I've ever witnessed, and I was sitting helpless in Washington. Um, so I thought, in hindsight, you know, hindsight, and in a novel, you can write whatever you want. So I wrote a book about what, how, what, what could the US do if we are watching somebody steal an election, literally before our eyes, watching somebody steal an election. We know what happens. They're denying it. And they're going and they're they're robbing the people of uh, of the vote. Uh, so that's the, minute zero is about about uh, an election. Um, third one was just a, is a fun book about Cuba. I started writing it before President Obama shocked everybody with normalization plans. Um, it was partly an excuse to go visit Havana. Um, uh, and that story is about uh, four middle-aged soccer dads from Washington D.C. that 
get kidnapped by the Cuban Navy while they're fishing in the Florida Keys, and my hero, Judd Riker, has to go rescue them. That's, that's a fun one. I hope we get that one on TV. Um, but this last one, the shadow list, to come back to this theme around crime and corruption, you know, I really wanted to write about, um, well, let me, I'll tell you, I'll go back to th this moment stuck in my head. Um, uh, so I should tell you the characters in my, so it's a four, it's a four book series. The, char the main character is an academic nerd that accidentally finds himself in, state, in the State Department who's supposed to run a crisis reaction unit. His job is to get the government to react more quickly to crises. And of course, that butts him up against the bureaucracy, which is trying to do everything slow, and everyone's trying to stop him. So it's partially action thriller, partially kind of legal thriller, where he's trying to weave his way through, through, um, through Washington, DC. Um, he's got a wife. Um, who um, is up to all kinds of things that he doesn't know about. She's sometimes helping him, sometimes not. Um, and he, the, 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 the real theme there is that whatever it looks like on the organization chart, the reality is that decisions and influence in Washington is all based on relationships. And so he has to learn how to build personal relationships. Uh, and one of his secret weapons is a lobbyist. Uh, a well-connected lobbyist who always seems to know what's really going on and can help him, help him navigate. Now, this is actually the only character in my books based on a real person is I was sitting in my office one day and uh, a well-known lobbyist came into my office and said, uh, who had helped me on, uh, on other issues, and she said, you have got, you have got to save uh, this man's life. Um, our partner in fighting corruption in Nigeria is going to be killed if you don't do something about it. Well, that gets your attention. Um, and so I started building a relationship with a guy named Nuhu Rabadu. Um, he was a lawyer and a policeman in Nigeria, and he was asked by the Nigerian president to start something called the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, uh, a kind of anti-corruption task force. Um, and he was really good at his job. In fact, he was too good at his job, and he started digging into all the lines of corruption, and it took him right into the presidential villa, and people around him were now um, threatening to kill him uh, because he was getting too close. Um, so I won't tell you everything that happened, but I was able to build this relationship with this, with this wonderful guy, um, kind of Elliot Ness of Nigeria, um, and he eventually had to flee the country um, and coincidentally, I had left government by then, and so I invited him to the think tank in Washington. He spent about 18 months with us. Um, he's now, the government has changed over uh, hands twice, so he's now back in Nigeria, um, uh, and I will go uh, launch the book, uh, of which there's a character inspired by him, launch the book in Nigeria in uh, probably late January. Um, uh, but what I learned from Nuhu um, is, a couple, is not just that there are still real heroes out there trying to fight crime and corruption, um, but I learned, I learned two, other, two other things from him. One, and this is a phrase directly from Nuhu, which I actually put in the book, which is, when you fight corruption, corruption fights back. And as he was becoming more and more successful, we were starting to get uh, reports that he was corrupt. He had a villa in Dubai. He had a private airplane. He took all of this money. Um, and many times I would hear about it first from one of his friends or from him. He'd say, hey, you're going to hear that I have a villa in Dubai. I don't. He, he, at one point, he put up a, uh, an ad in the Nigerian newspaper saying, um, there are claims I have these properties. If uh, anybody, um, I, I hereby give permission to seize all of these properties because none of them are mine. Um, there was a presidential, uh, there was a governor that he was going after named James Ibori of Delta State. Governors in Nigeria are incredibly powerful. They're like, uh, in some ways, mob bosses. Uh, um, James Ibori handed Nuhu Rabadu $15 million in cash and said, this is, for you to stop the, your investigation of my, of my businesses. 
And so he said, thank you very much. He took the 15 million and then submitted that as evidence for additional charges for trying to bribe uh, a policeman. So this is a really, a really incredible guy who was constantly under fire. His life was under threat. Charges were constantly being thrown at him. Um, so when you do fight corruption, corruption fights back. The other thing I learned from Nuhu Rabadu is, you know, I was, uh, you know, an American official working on American foreign policy, working with this brave policeman in Nigeria on fighting corruption, and I thought, oh, we're really helping him. You know, we helped save his life. We're help give, helping to give him tools. The FBI was working with him and his team to help train. And it, it felt very like, oh, well, we're helping Nigeria fight corruption, and that's also in our interest. Well, little did I know that Nuhu Rabadu was secretly working with the FBI on corruption charges against an American congressman. So if you remember uh, William Jefferson of Louisiana when they found um, all the um, cash in his freezer, um, that cash supposedly came from the Nigerian vice president. It was actually Nuhu Rabadu doing all of the investigation on the Nigerian side to help the US fight corruption. So this was a great case of Nigerian investigators helping us. Um, and I, it, I think that helped you know, chop down my ego by a couple of notches. That, that was pretty useful. But I thought all of that chaos um, and the whole Nuhu Rabadu story was a great basis um, for a story. And that is, uh, that is the shadow list, um, which opens with an American banker being caught up in one of these Nigerian prince scams. Uh, Judd Riker is supposed to find him, um, and chaos ensues from there. Um, there's a Russia angle as well as his wife is hunting a Russian international crime boss based in St. Petersburg. And they're, they're trying to keep their marriage together while also doing their jobs, so they're trying to keep their, their professional lives apart, and of course, it all it all gets re-entangled together. But I won't tell you any more about the book. But if you do get a chance to read it, I hope you enjoy it. And um, I hope you uh, let me know what you think. Um, so I'm easy to reach. Um, so just I want to end by talking about why, you know, why fiction actually um, is the way to do it, um, is the way to kind of illuminate some of these things about, foreign, uh, about US foreign policy, about reality. I still read a lot of nonfiction. I still write nonfiction. I'm a huge fan of nonfiction. But sometimes thrillers are better. Um, one thing they're better at is they are just way more fun to read. I get on the airplane. Last thing I want to do is read about reality. I like to read a thriller or, or a novel. And if I can learn something about it, that's, that's better. Um, but it's also that. As a former official, you're much, in, me, in many ways, you're much more ca uh, able to reveal reality through fiction than through nonfiction. Some of it's very simple. You cannot put classified information in a nonfiction book. You can dance around classified information in, in, a fi in fiction. Um, it's not, if I was still in government, I would still have to get it cleared. Um, I have a friend who's a diplomat at the State Department who writes fiction. All of his fiction has to be cleared. Um, uh, but I, so, you know, I'm obviously careful not trying to reveal anything that would put anyone in harm's way or anyone that would reveal anything in terms of intelligence. Um, but you can also tell lots of wacky stories. And the dirty little secret is that the reality is way crazier than the stuff I can make up. Um, it's also, getting back to the theme that Judd Riker has been learning, it's about building, Washington is about building relationships. And the worst thing you can do <laughs> is put real names in, store, in, in a book and burn people. You will literally burn your professional relationships. I've seen it many times. Um, but putting, fic, fi, you know, fic, creating fictitious characters, some of the, you can put little inside jokes where the people that you want to know who you're making fun of can know, but very often, hopefully all the time, the people you are making fun of don't know that the joke's on them. Um, I've only really had one case where that, uh, that didn't work out. Um, but then the last thing um, is, that, um, is that through fiction, you. I really wanted to take, you know, I, I was, I remember just being absolutely peppered with questions from my family when I'd come home about, what did you see? What is it like? Where, how did that happen? You know? And, 
Um, so I wanted, through fiction, to be able to take regular people, my aunt, my, uh, my, uh, my mother, um, my, now my kids, be able to take them into the Situation Room in the White House complex, into one of these meetings where everybody is just, you know, at each other's throats, um, into the, you know, the, a windowless room at one of our embassies overseas in the middle of a crisis, and hear how people debate what we should do, how, how they talk. I tried to make it accessible to regular people. Government people speak in their, in their own language. Um, but, try, but still try to get that so that when you read, if you, if, if, so that the readers of my books, when they read, you know, there's a coup in Egypt, or there's been an earthquake, or there's been some crisis, they might think a little bit, OK, I bet I know what's going on in the basement of the Eisenhower Executive Office building next to the White House uh, this morning. So why don't I stop there? Um, uh, and I'm happy to take questions on, on uh, literally anything. So, If you would uh, wait for the microphone to come to you, and do we have questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> So, like, what did you do in order to try and combat, like, China's political, geopolitical dominance in Africa? Ah, okay. I have never, in my, I give talks all the time. I have never given a talk on Africa and not gotten a China question. Um, so, look, China um, is, uh, is obviously very, very present in Africa. Um, I would say almost, for, for the most part, it's actually very positive. Uh, China's interests in Africa are mostly aligned with American interests. We, the United States and China, would like African countries to be more stable, to be safer, to be richer, uh, to do more business with us, um, and to be better allies. Um, and one of the principal ways to do that is to help build infrastructure. That's a huge problem in Africa, is just that the infrastructure is not there. It happens that the US is not very good at building infrastructure. We don't really have the tools to do a lot of it. We have a little bit, but not, not very much. China is really good at it. They have huge institutions that do it. The China Development Bank, um, which does projects in Africa, is bigger than any uh, US agency uh, of its equivalent. The China Export-Import Bank, is bigger than all the export-import banks of all the OECD countries. So take all the US, the US and all of our allies in Europe, Japan, Canada, Australia, add up all of our export-import banks. These are banks that finance trade. Add it all up, China XM is still bigger. Okay, so the scale, particularly on economic issues, trade, infrastructure, is just totally different. Um, so that can look really scary, but for the most part, it's actually good for the United States. Um, China's building a lot of highways, a lot of power plants, um, airports, stadiums, all kinds of things in Africa, and they're financing it. Um, so that's actually quite good. Uh, where I'd say the US and China um, differ, there's a couple of areas. One is we have a couple of countries that we would like to isolate and they want to do business with. So Zimbabwe and Sudan are two good examples of that. Um, uh, the, the, the other, I'd say, big issue is that one of the ways that, that the United States and, and most of Europe tries to encourage better economic performance in Africa is through greater transparency. Let's not have deals done under the table. If you sign a big debt, if you take out a big loan, report. Make the loan terms public. Um, so China doesn't always play by those transparency rules uh, in the same way. Um, uh, and that can have an undermining effect on what we think we're trying to do. If you're an African government, you now have two parties you can play off each other. So it's actually good for their negotiating power uh, in Africa. Um, uh, but in general, it breaks the Western cartel of finance which does undermine our influence. In some ways, that's good. In some ways, that's bad. Um, but for the most part, I'd say that, that Chinese influence is not something that we should try to resist. We can actually work with the Chinese in, in, a, in a lot of ways. 
Um, and then in the areas where we do have disagreements, we just have to work with them like we do in all international affairs. But it, it's something that we cannot resist and we actually shouldn't even really try. We can try to mitigate some of maybe the effects that we think are not so beneficial. Yeah. Sure. Okay, okay. Sure. <laughs> so, like, if, I have a laugh in that voice. All right. So if we're trying to like work with the Chinese in Africa, shouldn't we join like Africa or Chinese-led projects like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? <laughs> oh, okay. This is these are good questions. Um, uh, look, we yeah we probably should have become members of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, we blew that completely, completely mishandled. Um, uh, we still can do projects together. So there still are projects where even if we're not co-financing the exact same project, it could be that, um, that the Chinese are building the uh, power plant and we're building the transmission line. The Chinese are building the industrial zone and we're doing a training program. Like There can be complementary investments where we're working together. A great example, uh, in Liberia, a country where the US has spent a lot of money trying to help that country recover, uh, we wanted to rebuild the university. Uh, so the Chinese built the buildings and we trained the teachers. And that was, a, that was kind of everyone playing to their comparative advantage and it worked out really well. Now, there are lots of examples where it doesn't work out that well, but that, that's, uh, that's certainly, um, uh, that's certainly uh, you know, it's certainly possible on a piece by piece. And as well for the international institutions, Obviously, the Chinese, you know, a lot of the international financial institutions, the U.S. and China are both members, World Bank, African Development Bank. So, um, uh, you know, there are areas of cooperation there, but AIB is something that, uh, that we blew. Next question. I'm assuming you don't have much hope to reform the decision-making process on these State Department and uh, development uh, decisions and so forth, but what do you think are the best ways to more effectively deliver funding for development initiatives in mm. Africa, especially maybe the carbon funding that's lining up now ready to go into African nations, but the countries are not really ready to absorb yeah. those billions that are lining up? Yeah. So. Okay, I think those are kind of those are two excellent questions, kind of a little bit different. So, on r reform of U.S. institutions, so I think anybody that's worked in the in the government would readily admit that it's a mess. Um, it's you know highly inefficient, and there's a lot of waste. Um, in particular, so just the one issue, you know, there are just way too many offices and bureaus in the State Department that are competing with each other, and they're set up to compete with each other, and that kind of grinds everything to a halt. Um, there is a process in place right now to reform the State Department. Um, I would say the confidence among both State Department staff who admit that reform is necessary, and the foreign policy community that also hopes uh, for a good result, the confidence that this current process is going to lead to that is exceedingly low. Um, uh, and we can talk about why that is, but um, uh, there's, no, there's no good, there, there's no expectation that Secretary Tillerson it, the, the intention is to make it more efficient. They're just trying to essentially asset strip it. Um, and this is not a, even a partisan issue. This is, I mean, the Republicans on Capitol Hill are uh, exceedingly, you know, probably the most worked up over this. Um, um, uh, you know, the prospects for fixing the interagency problem, the problem with too many agencies around the table at too many times, that is fixable. That is fixable um, through restructuring the way the National Security Council works. Um, again, not a lot of confidence that that's going to happen in the current environment. Um, there, was an, there was a really, um, really disheartening article 
in the Washington Post a couple, maybe about, it was certainly before the election, maybe about two years ago, about Susan Rice, who was, national, who was President Obama's national security advisor. Now, she had been the national security advisor, um, uh, national security, senior national security person for President Clinton, his Africa advisor, in the White House. So she had been in the White House. She went out for the eight years of George W. Bush. Then she came back. And she was, whatever you think of her, she's an exceedingly capable bureaucratic player in Washington. She came back and she wrote this article in the Post saying that she was shocked that the national security staff had gone from like, I, don't, I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say 90 people to 400 people over the course of the, um, over the, course of the time she'd been out. And it really blossomed under Obama. The, um, the Africa staff, when I worked, was three people and it was at six um, at the end of the Obama administration. So she, when she moved from USUN to the White House to be National Security Advisor, she said her first task was to trim the National Security Council down to make it more efficient so that it wasn't just replicating a bureaucracy on top of bureaucracy. And she totally failed. And this is the story of how she just, this is what she wanted to do, super capable, had the president's ear, and she just couldn't get it done. The, the dynamics of bureaucracy did not allow it. Um, so the prospects for reform are pretty bad. Um, in terms of absorption of big dollars, I'm not that confident that the climate money for Africa is really there. Um, it might be there on paper, um, but the mechanisms that they're trying to use to spend it wisely is essentially the same mechanisms that we already have. You largely will use the multilateral financial system, which is to put it through World Bank type projects. Um, and I think that there's, there are definitely, you're right, there are definitely limits as to how well that can be spent. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is uh, repackaging old projects as green projects. So everything has a green component so that they can get this concessional finance. Um, but the World Bank system, and I worked for about a year and a half at the World Bank, um, lots of well-meaning people, but the system is... Um, the system has also gotten a bit clogged, um, and uh, it doesn't work the way that it's you know that it's that it's designed to work, which is to try to try to serve the client countries to uh, help them generate competitive economies. So it works in in, in some ways, but um, we're not. I don't think we're seeing a lot of innovation uh, with the climate finance stuff. I don't know if you have something in particular you're hoping I'd talk about. I think it's a major development challenge yeah. and I think the money's real. I think it's going to go there and I just think they're kind of stuck figuring out how to implement it. So it's it's an area that I dabble yeah. in as well. Cool. Great. Thanks for that question. Next question. Sorry to change the subject a little, but That's uh, okay. could you describe the process of how you were able to get some of your stories published? Sure. So um, for nonfiction, it's very straightforward. You write a book proposal, you pitch it to a publisher, they accept it or not, and you go. For fiction, it's completely different. Um, if you're a new author, you've never been published before, you have to finish a book. You have to have a complete um, novel. Um, and then you have to go to an agent. Unless your cousin is an editor at a publishing house, they will use agent, the, the editors, the commissioning editors will use agents as their vetting network, as their vetting system. So they work with agents that they trust so that if this agent picks up the phone and says, you know, Sue, you really have to read this, they will read it. Um, and so there's a whole network there. So the hard part is actually getting an agent. Um, most agents, the vast majority of agents are in Manhattan. They're all in New York, almost all of them. Mm -hmm. There are some in other places, but most of them are in New York. Um, and so when I finished my book, my, the, the lesson I'd suggest is when I finished my book, I thought, okay, well, now I actually want to publish it. Let me try to find an agent. I talked to people I knew who had published books to see if I could talk to their agents. Um, sometimes people are willing to do that, you know, um, and for very good reasons. 
you know, you don't want to flood your agent with everyone's request. You know, you, that's also putting a burden on your agent. You're trying to keep that relationship. So, you know, I had some introductions that way. Um, and then I did a lot of research to try to f find agents that were um, successful and liked the book the, in the niche that I was uh, selling. Um, so agents, like, you know, they have to specialize. Um, uh, so that's, a, you know, it, it's no point in selling a, trying to sell a thriller to somebody who's doing young adult. Um, so you try to do that and say, oh, I know that you did this book. I think you'd like this one. And see if you can get somebody to, um, to take a look. Normally, their web page will give you instructions for submissions. And you should follow those exactly. So it's like one page cover. And then they want, like, you know, a summary and maybe 15 pages or whatever they want. Um, so I did that. I did, went through a couple of rounds. I went back and forth with a few agents. Um, I really tried to exploit my network. I'm getting to, this, to, to, the, to the, um, the reason I'm telling you this long story. Uh, uh, I went back and forth with three or four agents that in the end, they, we, didn't, we didn't agree. And I kind of ran out of steam. I was out of, I probably talked to 25 agents and it didn't happen. I thought, okay, I, I don't know who to turn to now. So I just thought, okay, wait, everybody's in Manhattan, the agents. Who are the five people that I know who are just the most connected in New York City? I don't think they know anything about writing, but who are they? And I wrote them down, and I wrote to each of them, and I said, hey, I've written this novel. I'm really looking for an agent. I know you're super connected. Do you know anybody in publishing these five people? And that was how I got a whole bunch of new contacts. And never, never uh, <coughs> underestimate the power of random networking. So in the end, I got my agent which was, I wrote to my cousin. She told me that her husband has a client who's in publishing, who's a really nice guy. And it was through that guy that I met my agent. Um, so that is this, you know, that use LinkedIn and all of that, but you, you know, really, you, it's really a very random process. And this guy actually read, uh, read it, liked it, happened to like that it was kind of in the news because of the, real um, terrorism problems in Mali, and that, and that was it. And he was able to sell it within two weeks. Um, so it took like nine, eight or nine months to find the agent, but then two weeks once you were there. So that's the key. That's awesome. Cool. Other questions? Anything else? <laughs> um, why haven't like proposed solutions helped in the African famine? Oh, I don't know. Um, look, uh, you mean the current one in East yes. Africa? Um, the short answer is I have no idea. Um, uh, the, the, the sad reality is that most African agriculture is still very, very low productivity. It's still mostly smallholder, rain-fed. Um, and then if you look at yields, it's a fraction of what mechanized modern agriculture is all about. And those farmers are living close to the edge of poverty. And the, you have a bad year. You have political violence. Their margin of error um, is very, very thin. Um, I mean, look at, the, look at what the US has done. The, the, May, unbelievable infrastructure and financing and support services that we put in place to support farmers, because farming is an exceedingly risky proposition, right? Any season can break you, so you have to have all of this infrastructure, and African farmers just don't have that. It's low yield. They're not saving money, and the markets themselves don't work. So if, if there's a failure here, normally, you know, the market responds in the Food is delivered in different places, but the markets basically don't work. So you have these repeated emergencies. Um, uh, and you know, markets do work in Africa. Just for some reason, those food markets are not working. They're not working. But I, I would be lying if I told you I, I knew exactly why. All right. Hi. 
Um, you spoke a lot about corruption and cartels, I think illicit trade, and I was wondering if you had any comments about the role of legitimate businesses in corruption and changes that have happened in Africa. I know there's been some high profile, profile cases with like Shell, for instance, and their role in corruption in Nigeria. Um, the US passed the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and whatnot, and have those um, instances been changing or lessening over time? Yeah, so um, excellent question. So um, the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which makes it illegal for a US company, illegal here for a US company to offer a bribe to a foreign official overseas, has actually, uh, there, people were very worried that this was going to create a huge disadvantage for US companies. And what it's really done um, is it's really raised the bar because it's provided, it's provided a cover for American officials, businessmen, to be able to say no. Like, I can't do that. I, am not, I don't want to go to jail. And you can use that in your own negotiations. Um, and yet, do Americans lose out on some deals that way? Absolutely. Um, but they are raising the bar for the standards of corporate governance. Um, that doesn't mean companies don't get in trouble often. Um, uh, a lot of uh, European banks uh, have gotten in trouble. Um, you know, it's very enticing if you're looking for a huge deal. Let's say there's a billion dollar deal on the table and you can give a Mercedes Benz or a small nothing relative to the deal to the president's son to get that deal. It's exceedingly enticing. And then if you see, I don't know, pick on Malaysia, there's a Malaysian businessman who's handing over the keys to Mercedes to that son, you are like, why can't we just do that? So it, it is very hard. I think it's gotten a hell of a lot better, in part because it's not just the US. Other countries are really trying to um, raise the standards. And I think also that US, you know, the US, um, the expectations of US shareholders for US companies is that the companies we invest in are not doing shady things, right? We, we, we want to know exactly what the company is doing. How are they making their money? Because um, we own stock in that. Um, and so the SEC rules actually, and the SEC standards have actually been very good at raising um, those expectations within corporate governance. Um, again, you're going to have lots of examples where people fall, uh, fall short of the, of the standards. But I do think it's gotten, it's gotten a lot better. Um, one thing that's gone forward and then now back is there was a, you know, a, there's a lot of corruption in mining and oil and gas. Um, and it's because the stakes are so large and the decisions are made by so few people. Um, and so there was a long push um, started by the British government actually uh, for more transparency in the extractive industries. So there's something called the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI, which is um, basically that governments are going, governments should publish when they receive money from mining and oil companies. Um, and that's kind of working a little bit in some places. It certainly raised the transparency bar. Nigeria, for instance, never used to publish their budget or any information about um, their oil income, and now all of that is freely available. And that can create public pressure in Nigeria to spend the money well, to cut good deals, to do all the things governments are supposed to do. Um, then there was a rule as part of Dodd-Frank, I don't know if, if people know about this, but as part of the financial reforms post-crisis in the US, there was a rule that, um, uh, that companies listed on the stock exchange in the US would have to publish any payments they make to foreign governments. Uh, and it was targeting oil companies that were paying um, under the table and other um, expenses um, to governments. And that, that took a really long time to get the rule written. It was written, I think, right at the end of the Obama administration. And now the Trump administration is unwinding that. Um, so I think that's, that's unfortunate, um, uh, probably a step back. Um, but I still think that the overall pressure, even without that specific rule, the pressure on shareholders, you know, we all, through our, our 401ks, we all own all of these companies. 
And so we, you know, it's I think the the shareholder pressure to know if uh, if Exxon is cutting dirty deals or not is, is quite high. And there's so much attention on those companies. All the Wall Street analysts, um, the intelligence services, of course, also are trying to figure out where all the money is going. Um, that uh, I, I think we are seeing those standards raised. One, one thing I would just, just mention that I think had a hugely positive effect on all of this, um, and it was unintended, is after 9-11, the U.S. Treasury uh, essentially decided they had to figure out where all global money was going. They had to be able to track terror finance, and they set in place a whole series of financial action task force uh, and a whole series of surveillance of global finance um, that was designed to try to squeeze terror finance but it happens to be the exact same tool set that you would use to squeeze criminal activity. That's had a huge effect on money laundering and on um, hiding money. Um, now, it's a pain in the neck when you're trying to transfer money around and the Treasury Department wants all of this. Um, but one of the reasons Nuhu Robadu was so successful in Nigeria is that um, he had all of these tools that the US Treasury had built to track money in ways that they could never do before. Um, and the effect in Nigeria was that money was still being stolen, but it was staying in Nigeria. And it was helping to generate the domestic economy. It wasn't going into London property, because the Brits were not entirely, but mostly trying to stop that. So um, that's a kind of unintended positive effect of that that I think is is, uh, is actually quite, I think, hugely beneficial, hugely beneficial. Well, okay. with that, thank you so much, Todd. Great. We really appreciate well, thank your you. time coming here. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. So uh, that wraps up this evening. Uh, please be sure to check out theaustinschool.com for the lecture series updates, as well as whackaustin.org. And uh, thank you. We'll see you at the next event.